Good morning, friends. Welcome to another episode of BioNews. Today we'll be discussing three papers. The first, uh, by Silviera Rodriguez, is a controlled study of human type 2 diabetes patients. What they found was, in type 2 diabetes, over time, there is a loss of executive function in the brain. What they found was that giving these type 2 diabetes patients a combined training program involving resistance training and aerobic training could improve their executive function and the amount that it improved their executive function depended on how much their plasma levels of brain-derived neurotrophic factor were. So people with higher natural levels of this growth factor for the brain, that is the primary growth factor that SSRIs work around, were more likely to improve better from exercise. Why? Well, and they didn't say so in the paper, but let me tell you guys. Exercise, especially aerobic exercise, increases neurogenesis primarily via upregulating brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So most likely people with low levels of brain-derived neurotrophic factor may have had some pathology about their brain-derived neurotrophic factor, so it may respond less from the aerobic exercise. This is just me speculating, by the way. So in the next two papers, um, the, the second paper is a short one. I just want to mention a brief thing. But the main one I want to discuss is by Kim et al. So this is a review paper. And this is a review paper like we discussed yesterday about a subject that I don't know much about. This is uh, about prostate cancers and about specifically the use of androgen receptor blockade in the treatment of prostate cancers. So a prostate cancer is a, a cancer that affects men, that, that happens in their uh, private area and they're growing. And it is dependent often on androgenic signaling. Androgens include testosterone and dihydrotestosterone, which signal at the androgen receptor. But there's also forms of prostate cancers that become or are and what are called androgen receptor insensitive or androgen receptor independent, which means that even if you block, if you castrate the guy and he has no testosterone, no dihydrotestosterone, and you block the androgen receptors, the prostate cancer can still grow. So this is a very mysterious kind of prostate cancer. And generally, prostate cancers are of two, two kinds. One is a normal prostate cancer, which are mostly completely treatable. And the other kind is called aggressive prostate cancer, which quickly metastasizes, which means spreads into other organs and frequently kills people. So, and often the metastasizing version, the aggressive version is androgen receptor uh, independent or whatever. So this paper was reviewing the use of androgen receptor blockades and the treatment of prostate cancers. And I learned quite a few things in this paper that I didn't know before. So let me tell you what I learned in this paper. First of all, I learned that about 25% of androgen dependent prostate cancers and 60% of metastatic prostate cancers have mutations in the androgen receptor. Apparently, there are over 600 different kinds of mutations that can occur. And these mutations can cause, by the way, the androgen receptor to be overexpressed. It can cause the androgen receptor to bind tighter with ligands. It can cause the androgen receptor to bind to ligands that it shouldn't bind to. It can cause the androgen receptor to cause more, of, more response elements than it would normally cause. So there's a lot of things it can do. But to review just a couple of them, I'll just give you guys some examples. So for example, they can have mutations in the androgen receptor that can make the actual drugs used to block the receptor, the actual androgen receptor antagonists, become agonists. So the blockers can become ligands of the receptor, worsening the disease, disease progression. Uh, it can also cause the androgen receptor to become activated by normal hormones like progesterone, Dihyd I mean, not, uh, not even dihydro, not even dihydro progesterone, DHEA, uh, androstenediol. Uh, so basically, it can make your androgen receptor start responding to random molecules in the body, agonized by all kinds of molecules. So that's constantly getting activated, even when the person doesn't have many androgens. There are other mutations, like for example, the H874Y or the W435L mutations, which cause increased ligand binding. Meaning if a normal ligand like testosterone or trenbolone was in the body, it would bind tighter and cause more response elements. So uh, anyway, so those are some notes about mutations. Now about the therapy that's used to treat prostate cancers. There's some interesting notes I discovered here. First of all, about the androgen receptor blockade. They're called anti-androgens. 
The antiandrogens generally competitively bind, or the first generation of them competitively bind to the C terminal of the androgen receptor. So they bind there, so nothing else can bind there and activate it. The new generation of them act, uh, activate what's called co-repressors of the androgen receptor and inactivate co-activators of the androgen rece receptor so that they suppress the AR receptor transcription cascade but still allow it to translocate to the nucleus of the cell. So they don't totally block it but they basically inhibit its results in a little, a little bit. So I guess they may be sort of like SARMs. The second part, so the therapy always involves this. You block the androgen receptor and then a second part of it is you make sure the body doesn't synthesize androgens. So they block the androgen receptor with drugs like for example, the new generation drugs that I just described inclu include bicalutamide, nilu nilutamide, and flutamide. But so you do that, and then the second part is to use something that basically stops the body from synthesizing glutenizing hormone in the brain and follicle stimulating hormone. To do this, basically, you have to do something to the gonadotropin releasing hormone receptors in the pituitary. Your hypothalamus releases gonadotropin releasing hormone, your pituitary feels it. You gotta stop your pituitary from feeling it to be able to deal with the prostate cancer. So how do they do this? They use two methods. Either they use something like tryptorelin, which is a uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone receptor agonist, which means it acts like gonadotropin releasing hormone, but it just agonizes it and doesn't let it go. Now, as you guys will know if you watch Derek and Steve and I's podcast, uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone is pulsatile. It agonizes the receptor and releases it. If, it, if you take something like tryptorelin that just agonizes and doesn't release it, it'll actually cause the receptors in the pituitary to downregulate and the body will stop producing LH and uh, FSH eventually. But, um, so the problem is though, if you don't, initially when you do this, when you add tryptorelin, it's actually gonna cause a surge though, because it's actually an agonist. So in the cases when they're concerned about the surge of testosterone in the beginning, they'll actually use a gonadotropin-releasing hormone antagonist instead. But otherwise, they usually use an agonist. And there's a few examples here like tryptorelin, histrelin, luprolide acetate, gocerelin acetate. These are all things that are mostly useless unless you want to castrate yourself or there's some very limited examples where it could be useful. A final thing that the paper, well, I guess it's not entirely final, but one other thing that the paper discussed, which is not quite re related to this treatment thing, it's an old treatment mechanism, but something that I found interesting myself, I think some of you may find interesting also. There's a kind of shampoo called Nizoral. I first learned about it when I was in high school. Actually, I was probably using it in high school. Yeah, I was. It's called Ketoconazole. I never knew that ketoconazole was actually a very interesting medication. So ketoconazole used to be provide as, provided as a treatment instead of a gonadotropin-releasing hormone agonist or antagonist. It used to be to suppress testosterone synthesis in the body. But it was discontinued finally in 2013 because of the hepatotoxicity and other side effects that it came with orally. Now what it does, its mechanism of inhibiting testosterone synthesis is apparently not completely understood. I had to do some digging to figure this out. But apparently it inhibits some CYP enzymes that in the testes, the adrenals, the ovaries, the liver, the kidneys that may be involved in the synthesis of some of these things. It may interfere with cholesterol synthesis. It blocks the androgen and glucocorticoid receptors and it inhibits some aromatase activity. So it does all kinds of things to inhibit steroidogenesis in the body. I had no idea about this. So apparently you, when you're using Nizoral in your hair, you may potentially be doing a little bit of that too. I never realized this, you know. I mostly thought of Nizoral as an antifungal medication that somehow had some other steroid, steroidal effect, but I didn't know what it was. Well, I guess I still don't know what it was, but I, now at least I know nobody knows what it is. <laughs> anyway, so the final thing I want to see basically is why I covered this paper in so much detail with you guys is imagine if there's 600 mutations that can happen during someone's lifetime or genetically that can make that androgen receptor not only much more susceptible to testosterone, but just overexpress itself or um, uh, transact or, or, or react better to agonism from a ligand or even start to respond to non-ligands as ligands. So th there may be people around the world who are responding a little bit to DHEA as if it's an androgen. So imagine the kind of polymorphisms that we have. So that, that this may be some of the reasons that we see certain people have extremely thick beards so, and don't go bald. 
you know or for example certain people gain muscle so easily or respond so well when they go off cycle and recover so quickly and so on there may be just such a, a susceptibility to sense that androgen signaling where someone else like myself may have what's fundamentally an androgen receptor resistance of some kind anyway thank you guys so much for bearing with me i'll see you next time for another episode of bio news